Hello friends, welcome to the first of many videos covering osteology. In this video, I will go over major functions of the skeletal system, as well as how we categorize the many parts of the human skeleton. After that, we will move on to learn major landmarks found on the clavicle and the scapula. Other videos will follow this one, and they will continue to identify landmarks on the rest of the bones. With that, let's begin with the skeleton as a whole. The skeleton consists of 214 bones. Now, online and other textbooks, they'll say that there's usually 206 bones in the human body, but I'll explain why later that there's actually 214 bones in the human body. So, the skeletal system. What is its function and purpose? Well, there are three major things that the skeletal system does for us. The first one being, it is our body structure slash support. Okay, so as you can see, um, the skeleton is what kind of is our framework of the human body. Muscles surround it, internal organs are encircled by it typically. It is our structure, and since it's our structure, it is our support. All these bones, especially in the legs, they bear all the weight that gravity pulls down on us, as well as all the loads that we carry on ourselves. So that is the first major function of the skeletal system. The second one is protection. Okay, The skeletal system covers up, like I said earlier, lots of vital organs. We have our heart that's... Um, within our thoracic cage, protected by our ribs. Our brain is surrounded by all of our um, bones of the skull. Okay, There's a lot of different organs that are protected by the skeletal system. And the last major um, purpose of the skeletal system is that it's responsible for body movement. With skeletal muscles, um, Together, they allow us to have range of motion and movement along with our joints. So those are the three major functions of the skeletal system. They provide structure, protection, and body movement. Now, the skeletal system as a whole is very complicated. Like I said, there's 214 bones within us. So anatomists like to break down the skeleton into two major parts. The first part being... The appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton consists of all the bones found in our limbs. You can see here the bones that are part of the superior limb, and you can see the bones of the inferior limb. That is all what the appendicular skeleton is. You can see that all the vertebrae are gone, the ribs are missing. All those bones are part of what we call the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton consists of 80 bones, and they are all the bones of the head, the bones of the spine, the, you have your costal bones or your ribs, and your sternum. Okay, That is all the axial skeleton. So if it's not found in the superior inferior limb, it's going to pertain to the axial skeleton. Okay, Now we can move on now to the superior limb. In both superior limbs, there's a collection of 68 bones, meaning there are 34 bones in the right superior limb and the same in the left superior limb. Now, I'm going to go ahead and name most of the bones of the superior limb, and then I'll go into more detail with the bones that I don't name right now. So the first bone that we have in the superior limb is the clavicle. Okay, we have one clavicle, we have one scapula, we have one humerus, one radius, one ulna, we have eight carpal bones, which are found right here, okay, then we have five metacarpal bones, Four, and those metacarpal bones are right here just above them, just distal to the carpal bones. And then we have 14 phalanges. And these right here 
or your phalanges. 14 phalanges. Okay? Now, the superior limb has to attach itself to the trunk of the body, correct? So how does it anchor itself to the trunk? Well, there's a special structure that we that the anatomists have come up with, and it is called the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle consists of two clavicles, two scapulae, which is plural for scapula, and one sternum. Now, again, let me repeat what I said before. The pectoral girdle is the manner for which the superior limb is able to be anchored to the trunk. Okay? Now, the inferior limb has a similar process of anchoring itself to the trunk, and that's through the pelvic girdle. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail with the pelvic girdle right now. I'm not going to name the bones that make it up. I'll mention that when we go over inferior limb osteology. But I just wanted to make it clear that there are two girdles in the human body, the pelvic girdle and the pectoral girdle. And they both have the same function in that they anchor the superior and the inferior limbs to the trunk. Now, returning back to this slide. Now, if you did the math... With all, the, with all the bones of the superior limb, it doesn't add up to 34, and if you, do, if you multiply it by 2, it doesn't add up to 68. And this is the reason why. There are a set of bones called sesamoid bones. And they are very, very small. Now, there's several different sesamoid bones throughout the body. There's some in the inferior limb as well as in the superior limb. In the case in the superior limb, there are two sesamoid bones, and they are found right at the base of the thumb, right where this circle is. Now, when I said earlier in this video that a lot of textbooks and a lot of other anatomy videos and articles, when they state that there are 206 bones in a, an adult human body, the reason why our count is different than their count is because they don't take in consideration the sesamoid bones in the superior and inferior limb. And for what that reason, I'm not sure why they don't count them, because the majority of the people of the population, um, they have these sesamoid bones at the base of their thumb, as well as the ones in their in the inferior limb. But for whatever reason, they don't include them in the count. But they are bones. They are f f seen in um, radiographs. So there are 214 bones in the human body. Now, with that, we can go ahead and move on to the clavicle. Now the clavicle, even though it seems to be a really small bone, it's actually one of the most frequently fractured bones in the body. Now it makes up part of the pectoral girdle like I mentioned just before, and it has a few landmarks that we need to know. But before I go over those, we need to learn something that's called parenting. And this applies to any part of anatomy. When you name a landmark on an organ, you always have to return that name of the landmark to the name of the organ. And here's an example. Right here, this is called the body. Now, there's many bones in the human body that have a body. So, if I just said, oh, um, look at the body of that bone, no one would know what I'm talking about. But if I said, that's the body of the clavicle then people would understand what I'm talking about, okay? A lot of bones share landmarks with the same name. And so if you just name the landmark, um, confusion can, can, can occur. So that's why you always have to parent it back to the organ, okay? And at first it may seem confusing, but as you study anatomy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a lot more sense with practice. So this long portion right here, the majority of the bone, is the body of the clavicle. On the lateral most portion of the clavicle, you have this flattened part right here. And this is going to be called the acromial extremity of the clavicle. It's the most lateral part, like I said, of the clavicle and it's adjacent to the scapula. 
Now this thickened portion right here, it's kind of roundish. This is going to be called the sternal extremity of the clavicle. Okay, it's called the sternal extremity of the clavicle because it's the part of the clavicle that's right next to the sternum. So a lot of these names make sense. So the sternal extremity is right up against the, the sternum. The body is the bulk of the bone. And then the acromial extremity of the clavicle is right up next to the scapula. Okay, now there's one more landmark that I need to point out. And it's this tiny little bump right here. This bump right there is called the conoid tubercle of the clavicle. of the clavicle. Okay? And that's it. That's all you need to know as far as landmarks on the clavicle. Again, we can review. Right here, we have the sternal extremity of the clavicle. This flattened portion on the lateral aspect of the clavicle is the acromial extremity. And then the bulk of the bone itself is going to be called the body of the clavicle. And that's it. Those are all four landmarks that you need to know for the clavicle. Now moving on to the next bone, which would be the scapula. The scapula is far more complex than the clavicle, and it has a ton more landmarks than the clavicle does. So right here, we have this surface. All of this right here is the anterior surface of the clavicle. I mean of the scapula. Pardon me. This is the anterior surface of the scapula. All this. And that's the name of it. Okay? Anterior surface of scapula. You notice how I parented it back to the scapula. Now, another appropriate name for the anterior surface of the scapula is the costal surface. Costal refers to ribs. So this surface articulates and is right up against the rib cage. So you can say anterior surface of the scapula or costal surface of the scapula and they both mean the same thing. Okay? Now, there is a depression right here, right where this darkened circle is. Okay? And it actually is much larger than that. It's probably about that size. In this right here, this depression is called the subscapular fossa. So I'm just going to do this right here. Now fossa means depression. Okay? Now whenever there's a depression, there's more than likely going to be a fossa. Okay? So this is the subscapular fossa of the scapula. Good. Now right here, this landmark right here, this projection, this is going to be called the acromion of the scapula. Now this might sound similar to the acromial extremity of the clavicle, and you would be correct, because the acromial extremity of the clavicle articulates, arti articulates or is adjacent to the acromion of the scapula. Okay? And that's why it's named the way it is. Just like the sternal extremity of the clavicle is right up against the sternum, the acromial extremity of the clavicle is right up against the acromion of the scapula. Now this projection right here, that's going to be called your coracoid process of the scapula. Okay? Process usually is a projection coming off the bone, a sticky outy thingy. Okay? So anything that kind of pops out of the bone is more than likely going to be called a process. Now, before we go into other landmarks, I need to um, go over these points right here. That one, and then there's one over here, and then there's one down here. Okay, these right here are called angles. Now this one right here 
is the most lateral angle on the scapula. So we're going to call it the lateral angle of the scapula. Okay, now this one right here is going to be the most superior. So it's going to be called the superior angle of the scapula. And as you guys can guess, the one that's most, most inferior right here is going to be called the inferior angle of the scapula. Now I'm going to go ahead and change colors now. And I'm going to go over another landmark that's important. Now right here we have something that kind of connects all three of them together. Okay, These are going to be your borders. So right here is going to be the lateral border of the scapula. We have our superior border of the scapula. And as you guys can probably assume, this is going to be the medial border of the scapula. Now this image is getting kind of full, so I'm going to switch over now to the posterior um, aspect of the scapula. Now, just like the anterior surface of the scapula had a surface, the posterior also has one, and it's, sim it's named the same thing, but just in the posterior aspect. All of this is going to be the posterior surface of the scapula. Okay? Now, you can see that there's a small depression right here and right here. And it's divided by this long um, landmark. And it kind of sticks out and divides the two. This landmark right here is going to be called the spine of the scapula because it looks kind of similar to the spine. It's long, it's elongated, it's firm, okay? Now, because of this, this depression is underneath the spine. So we are going to call this the infraspinous fossa of the scapula, okay? Infraspinous fossa, fossa mean depression, of the scapula. With that information, you can probably know that this is going to be the supra spinous fossa of the scapula. Okay? Now if you notice that the spine, the continuation of the spine of the scapula laterally forms the acromion of the scapula. And right here, once again, you can see the coracoid process. Not too bad. Now, right here, you see this notch, and you can also see it on the anterior surface. This is going to be called the scapular notch of the scapula. Okay? Now, right here, there's kind of a thinning, and then this projection comes out. This thinning or narrowing is going to be called the neck of the scapula. Not too hard. Now, where the lateral angle of the scapula was, you have this depression. Now, this is kind of a rule breaker because when I, I said when you hear depression, think fossa. Well, this is a rule breaker. This depression where the lateral angle of the scapula resides is called the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Okay? And that's it. Those are all of the landmarks for the scapula. So now you know the landmarks for the scapula, both posterior and anterior um, aspects of it. You also know the landmarks on the clavicle. And that's it. That's all that we're going to cover in this video. In the next video, we'll be covering the rest of the bones in the superior limb.